Good morning, Capital Church family. Just want to welcome you to our online service this morning. Or if you're joining us Saturday night, Saturday evening, or Saturday afternoon, we just want to say welcome and thank you for tuning in. And we're so glad that you're going to, you're going to dive in with us this, this morning or this afternoon. And yes, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm back. Uh, uh, Lynn and I have recovered from our COVID. Um, we all went back to work this past Monday and feeling great. Just want to say thank you for the prayers. Thank you for reaching out. Thank you for the text messages and the emails. And um, I just want to say um, what a great opportunity for us to share today and and dive into God's Word. And I feel like God's got a word for me to give to you, a word of encouragement. Let's pray before we get started. Just join me wherever you are for a time of prayer real quick. Father, we just thank you for an opportunity today to look at your Word God, we praise you for what you're doing in our lives. And Father, I just pray that these next few minutes, God, that you will um, get our attention on the things that you want to say to us. And God, I pray that wherever everybody is, God, I pray that uh, your presence will be manifest. God, and your truth will be revealed. And Father, I pray that uh, you will anoint this time as we uh, look to you for for direction and some answers, Father. We ask all these things in your precious Son's name. Amen. Amen. I want to say right up from the start, I just want to thank Pastor Ryan for the opportunity to share today and, and, um, uh, and to preach and to address uh, the congregation at TCC. And it's an honor to do that. And I don't take that lightly. I'm on assignment today. Um, so let's, let's dive into this. Um, a few years ago, I had an opportunity to attend a student ministry conference um, in, at, at, in Chicago, and I, I went every year. Um, and this conference was, uh, was held annually, and I always looked, I always looked forward to, go, to going for a variety of reasons. Um, the main reason being the information was always, always relevant and, and very helpful, um, and it was useful to make me a better leader. And one of the main sessions that was offered uh, that year was a presentation on the emerging church and what impact uh, it was going to have on youth ministries in the future. Um, I believe the name of the session uh, was entitled, They Like Jesus, But They Don't Like the Church. And I sat uh, completely engaged um, as the presenter talked about the popularity of Jesus. Never, never had I ever kind of thought about how popular Jesus was and is so today. Um, and actually, they were talking about marketing strategies that existed to sell the product Jesus. The popularity of these strategies, uh, they, they still exist today. You can find Jesus in Bible scriptures and the Bible and Bible images almost everywhere. Uh, you can find Jesus on highway billboards. You can, he's on tote bags. He's on bumper stickers. He's on wood plaques. He's on woodworkings. He's on furniture. He's on crafts that people make and sell. He's on coffee cups. He's on business slogans. He's on t-shirts. He's on bracelets. He's on jerseys. He's on clothing. He's in jewelry. He's, he's, on the, he's in the latest and on the latest books. He's, on, he's in, in, on, in, in video series. He's being branded all over the world. You can see him in art. You can see him in sculptures. You can see him in paintings. And many musicians across the world have spent hundreds of years telling you about him in song. His images are seen on buildings, glass windows, TV commercials, magazine stands, newspapers, blogs, vlogs. You can hear about him in podcasts. And, and if you want to, and many people try to do this, they, they, you can watch on television and they preach and they teach about him every single day. And if you can't see that live, you can subscribe to a YouTube channel or a Facebook posting or a Twitter feed and you can find Jesus there. He's on coins, advertisement on vehicles. He's in headwear. You can even go to the National Hall of Fame for bobbleheads. And guess what? Yes, for $25, you can order a Jesus bobblehead. And yet, Jesus is popular beyond our imagination. 
and his notoriety is around the world, and people are intrigued about Jesus. And even though Jesus has had all this exposure, there seems to be some kind of lacking or disconnect from what Jesus is and who he is for us. A few years back, the Barner Group did some research on what Americans believe about Jesus. The research found that a vast majority, number one, a vast majority of Americans believe Jesus was a real person. More than nine out of 10 adults say Jesus Christ was a real person who actually lived, while the percentages begin to dip slightly among younger generations. Number two, the research found out that the younger generations are increasingly less likely to believe Jesus was God. There's some confusion about who Jesus was. The historicity of Jesus may not be in question for most Americans, but people are much less confident in the divinity of Jesus. This is what Barner was found finding out. Number three, Americans are divided on whether Jesus was actually sinless. Perhaps reflective of their questions about Jesus' divinity, Americans are conflicted on whether Jesus committed sins during his earthly life. About half Americans agree either strongly or somewhat that he lived on earth, he was human, and committed sins like other people. Number four, Barna found out that most Americans say they have, they, they've actually made a commitment to Jesus. On the whole, America is still committed to Jesus. The act of making personal commitment to Jesus is often kind of seen as his first step in becoming a Christian. While the majority of Americans report such a commitment, some groups are significantly most likely to have done so more than others. Number five, this is what Barna found out. People are conflicted between Jesus' good deeds as a way to heaven. So in other words, people are under this belief that if they're good and they do good things, they're going to heaven. You can see that even in the midst of Jesus being popular, people marketing him, there still seems to be some confusion about who he really is and what he does. We can see this in our culture. We can see that this is a problem within our culture. And even Jesus, at the height of his popularity, there's still some confusion. The people of faith, Bible-believing Christians, have some work to do. Jesus has always caused people to inquire about who he really is. And on one occasion, he asked Peter, who do, who do men say that I am? And with the days that we face ahead, as we're going to have to take a hard look at what's it going to actually take to help these people understand who Jesus really is and what he really does. From the beginning, Jesus has drawn crowds. Jesus drew big crowds in his ministry. It's been like that from the beginning. I like the way Bruce Metzger in one of his systematic uh, text, uh, textbooks he breaks Jesus' ministry down. He's, he divides it up in like three periods. Each period lasted about a year, and each had its own special feature. The first year was a year of obscurity. This is basically simply due to the scarcity of information that we kind of have about Jesus. And partly because during this time, Jesus seems to have been like slowly coming into, into public view. That's the year of obscurity. He spent most of his time in the area of Judea during this time period. The second year that Metzger breaks down is the year of public favor. It's at this time that Jesus, uh, his fame as a teacher, his fame as a healer is extended far and wide. People are getting to hear what Jesus is actually doing and the, the healings that are happening and the the, the, the people that are sitting and listening to him teach, most of his activity during this time period lasted about 15 months, and it was kind of confined to an area uh, in, in, in Galilee, the northern region of Palestine. The third period is the period of opposition. Jesus' public uh, favor, his popularity, um, kind of falls away, and Jesus' enemies begin to multiply. And until at last, they manage to secure a plan and have Jesus executed. 
The first part of the final year was spent in Galilee, and then later on it was spent in parts of Palestine. So it was year of obscurity, year of public favor, year of opposition. And I, I want to spend some time this morning just kind of diving into this, this, that year of public favor where it just seemed like everything that Jesus was doing, crowds were gathering to see and get, get, get close to, to what Jesus was, was saying and doing. I want to focus on that. It was during that, this time that, that, that Jesus is in Galilee and crowds begin to follow him without any means of publicity or Facebook, great numbers of people begin to come under Jesus' influences of his teachings. You had the healing of the Roman centurion, uh, centurion's paralyzed servant in Mark 8, 5 through, <clears throat> Mark 8, 5. And then you have it in Luke 7, 1 through 10. You've got Peter's mother-in-law uh, is healed. You've got people oppressed with various afflictions and diseases are healed. The number of followers are increasing and so are the crowds. The point, to the point on one occasion, his audience goes to the thousands. Some say 4,000, some say 5,000. The gospel of Mark is, is actually recording these happenings and it's moving quickly to tell us that Jesus is growing in popularity and crowds begin to follow and they're amazed at what is happening and they cannot get enough. Jesus is preaching and he's teaching and he's healing and people are coming and they're looking and they're watching. And on one occasion, we are told about some faith of some friends that make or made the difference. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to open them up to Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. This is God's word. Mark is telling us about the, the, the popularity of what's happening in Jesus' ministry. And this is what it says in verse 1. It says, a few days later... When Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left. And, and nor even outside the door, he preached the word to them. And some men came bringing him to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, by digging through it and then lowering the mat the man was lying on. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there. They were actually sitting in that crowd, thinking to themselves, Who does this fellow think he is? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that what was they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is it easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take up your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up took his mat, walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. I want you to kind of put yourself in the crowd that day. I want you to kind of take yourself and put your, put, put, you're in Capernaum, and you've heard about Jesus Christ. You've heard the popularity. You've heard about the, 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 in, the increase of the crowd size. You've heard that something's going on with a guy named Jesus. He's teaching. He's healing. And you're in this crowd. And you know that these people are following him everywhere. And he's coming to your town. He's coming to Capernaum. The narrative, the narrative tells us that these four guys have... have have a friend who needs a healing touch instead of being, and instead of being a spectator that day, instead of being part of the crowd, they made up their minds to actually get their friends to Jesus. And if you can picture the obstacles that these guys were facing, this guy is lame, he's paralyzed, he can't get to Jesus, and these four guys try to, 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 to see where they can get to him. The crowd, 
they can't go through the door, and they come up with the idea of getting on the rooftop and start taking the roof apart. And, and if you were to maybe look historically at how homes were built, probably some thatched roof in the pat, and that, that was patched with some, uh, some patch or some thatch or whatever. These guys start ripping up this home. We don't, we don't even know whose home it was. Some, some you know, scholars debate on whose home it was, but they're ripping the roof off. And these guys, they've heard about Jesus. They've heard what he can do. They actually are tearing apart this roof and they, 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 they do not let the obstacles to keep them from getting their friend to Jesus. And they, they, they take the roof off and they lower this man right in front of Jesus. Jesus sees their faith. He sees their faith in action. The word, the Greek word there for faith, when he says he saw their faith, is that the implications are, is that there's this action based on trust. In other words, they felt that if they could get their friend, this paralyzed man, to Jesus, that they knew and they were trusting that Jesus was going to do something to this man. So think about that. This kind of faith that moves people to action. This kind of faith that doesn't let obstacles stand in the way of getting people to Jesus. When you look at this story, it says a lot about these men. They were desperate to get this paralyzed man to Jesus. What does it say about their tenacity? What does it say about their fortitude? What does it say about their thinking? They're not gonna let anything stand in the way of Jesus healing this guy. And in the midst of the confusion that we experience today about who Jesus is and the chaos that's surrounding our lives, Jesus is calling us to be those kinds of people of faith and to respond like people of faith. He's calling us out of speculation. He's calling us out of spectating and into a field to labor and to share and to live and to express our faith through action. I think in days ahead, we're going to need people of faith to step up. And there's some characteristics I think that it's going to take necessary for us to achieve the calling of faith that Jesus is calling us to do. And I want you to write these down. I've talked about some of them in the past. And I want to kind of, I want to kind of re -hit, I want to hit those things again because I think it's essential. Number one, people of faith will always have a preoccupation with people. The paralyzed man had some friends that were concerned about his situation. And it wasn't that they were just concerned about it. They weren't just concerned about his need. They simply cared enough to do something about it. Acts of kindness. that are expressed through the people of faith that's, that, that should be motivated, motivating us by the love of Christ. People who have a heartbeat after Jesus will always care about people who are disenfranchised, people who are lost, people who need help, people who need to be valued, people who are economically challenged, and people who are addicted and are part of self-destructing systems. People of faith will always be preoccupied with people like that. And they'll care, not just in what they say and what they do. And it's because of this faith that's in us, this action that we actually believe that if we can get people in God's presence, that, that there'll be a change that happens in their life. We want, people of faith want to make a difference. 
And they understand and are connected to God's heart about those things. Because God values people, and we should too. We say, come have a seat at the table. Pastor Ryan and, and Pastor Lot preached a couple weeks ago. They both mentioned this understanding that, that in their sermons, just this, this understanding and this biblical truth that, that the love of Christ and the gospel and the life-changing power of Jesus Christ is for everyone everywhere. And it's not just for a, a few over here or a, a little limited few over here. It is whosoever will come and sit at the table. Jesus is calling people of faith to have a preoccup preoccupation with, with people who are far from him. And not just an understanding or thoughts of those things, but an understanding of how actively can we get people to Jesus. I think the second thing that people will have that helps move people to Jesus out of these crowds will be people of faith understand eternal realities. We recently, we recently have lost people here at TCC People are slipping into eternity. Death is a reality. And we have got to understand the time and space reality. That our, our time here is short compared to an eternity. And that we have to understand what it takes to make it into the afterlife. Jesus is the way. And because of his atoning work on the cross and the shedding of his blood, that he can forgive our sin and reconcile us to God. Only people make a permanent reality. And people of faith understand that. We're all on a time clock. And we have to calculate our sense of urgency to share God's love and to be motivated in faith to share the gospel to people who don't know it because people may die without it. Number three, I think people of faith understand the potential in people. What happens when the power of Christ touches someone's life? When God's redemptive live comes into a person's life and it touches everything and it lifts everything. We've talked about that. That it touches their, their workplace and it touches their finances and it touches their, their families. And, and there's this extended reach of lift that, that the redemptive power of God does. People of faith understand the potential in people, that whenever they respond to a loving God and a caring God, that, that that change that happens in their life becomes a motivating force and a motivating uh, push for people to express the life change that's happened in people's lives. The healing of a paralyzed man shook Capernaum. People were amazed at what happened. And if you were in the crowd that day and you saw that interaction that Jesus has with the religious leaders and then Jesus approaches that by not only forgiving his sins but telling a man who's paralyzed to get up and walk, the, the, um, the immediate impact on the potential of what happened to that guy is life-changing. I think number four, people of faith understand and have an irresistible optimism that lives can change. That everyone is valued and everyone matters. 
And it doesn't matter background. It doesn't matter economic background. It doesn't, it doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter what side of the tracks you lived on. It doesn't matter what job you work. It doesn't matter what country you live in. There is an ir- people of faith understand and have an irresistible optimism that lives can change. Jesus can change lives. People of faith, they want to see people be transformed into the image of Christ. Romans 8. We believe, people believe that, that, that people can grow and they can change and they can have influence for the kingdom of God. They believe in and are optimistic about plans and strategies to see life transformation. It's what people of faith, they care. They care about seeing lives changed. And they believe that God can do the miraculous. That God can supernaturally step in and do something miraculous that cannot be explained. But only God I think number five, people of faith will not be deterred with skepticism. The lame man that was lowered in front of Jesus had a decision to make. He he sat there and and when Jesus saw his his friend's faith, he, he, he hears Jesus forgive his sins, but then he hears the religious bunch start clamoring and chatting and bannering over who Jesus is and what, how, how does he have the power to do that and he's a blasphemer. And at that moment and at that time, that lame man had a decision to make. And that decision was simply this. Are you gonna listen to what people are saying about Jesus? Or are you gonna follow what Jesus commands you to do? Jesus says to the man, rise up and walk. Or are you going to listen to the naysayers and stay on the mat? I believe people of faith are going to have to get to the point when we are following what Jesus is saying and we're going to have to rise above the skepticism. We're going to have to rise above the banner and the chatting and the, and, and, the, and the conversations that take us off focus. We're going to have to actually step into this understanding and not be detoured, not be detoured by it. That we're actually going to move forward in what God has called us to do. People of faith are not detoured by what people are saying. I can remember in the past and hearing things and trying to navigate ministry through skepticism. But deep down inside this trust in what Jesus has said was way more important. We have to get to the point where we rise above all that and we have, to, we have to move past the, the conversations that keep us from moving in faith. I'm gonna close with this. For some of you, I think this is gonna be really, really, really important. I and preaching in front of an empty sanctuary. And you are at home right now. And if you read the count that Mark tells us, Jesus is home. Like I said earlier, we don't know whose home it was. But we know their home. And we know 
that Jesus is doing something in the home. He's forgiving sins and he's healing people. And I know some of you right now need Jesus to do something in your home. You need Jesus to heal you. You need Jesus to do the miraculous. You need Jesus to forgive your sin. You need Jesus to move you from the crowd and spectating into participation. You need Jesus to step into your home and change it. And he will. And my prayer is that every home, every home right now that is listening and watching, whether you're part of TCC's family or whether you're part of an extended TCC family or whether you're, you're friends of people that are in this church that are on Facebook watching, I pray right now in the powerful name of Jesus right where you are in your home that Jesus does something supernatural. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that we can look to the scriptures and know and see what you've called us to do. Father, as people of faith, we always want to be preoccupied with people. We always want to begin to to see how we can help people and move people closer to, to who you are so that you can forgive their sin and God, you can heal, heal them and touch them. God, we thank you that you've called us to be people of faith and understand eternal realities, God. God, we thank you, God, that you've called us to be people of faith and we understand the potential in people. And God, we thank you today that we are called to be people of faith and have an understanding and an irresistible optimism, optimism that lives can change when they meet Jesus. And finally, we thank you this morning that you've called us to be people of faith, God, that will not be deterred by skepticism or chatter or conversations that take us off course and down places that you've not even called us to, God. And Lord, I just pray for people in their homes, God, that they'll be people of faith and they will experience, God, your healing, Lord. God, we ask you to touch families who are struggling with COVID and God, we ask you, God, to touch, God, hearts that are broken because they've lost family members, God, this past year. God, we ask you to heal up wounds, God, God, we pray that your spirit, God, and your miraculous power, God, begins to move into hearts, God, and people's homes as you've called them to be people of faith, God. We call on you again, God, to do something miraculous. God, call us to be people of faith. And Lord, we know it is because of what you do that makes the difference. And God, I pray, God, in our own lives, God, whether it's in our home, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, that God, we will continue to make the name of Jesus famous. And God, we will continue to sing songs that glorify your name. And God, I pray that you will give us opportunities this year, the years to come, to see a great harvest, Lord. We know that everything is kind of being positioned for that. We believe that. But God, help us to be people of faith in times like this. We do not walk by sight. We walk by faith, trusting in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining with us this morning. I pray that this is an encouragement to you. Let's be people of faith in 2021. Thanks. We'll see you soon.